number 19.
tell you Bibles this morning, our devotional uh, is going to be taken out of the book of Exodus, uh, Exodus chapter 15, I'm going to read uh, verses 22 uh, down through <clears throat> verse 27, uh, so Exodus 15, uh, verses 22 down through 27. Uh, this particular passage, of course, deals with Moses uh, as he is leading the Israelites uh, in their uh, journey. Uh, this particular passage, we are uh, coming back to what we originally started looking at in these devotionals, which, of course, is uh, the names of God. And so the name that he is uh, given in Scripture, we're going to find that in verse 26. But beginning in verse 22, it says that Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea, and they went into the wilderness of Shur. And they went in three days in the wilderness and found no water. When they came to Marah, they could drink of the waters of Marah, for they were bitter. Therefore, the name of it was called Mar. And the people murmured against Moses, saying, What shall we drink? And he cried to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree. <clears throat> which when he had cast into the waters, the waters remained sweet. There he made for them a statute and ordinance, and there he proved them. And he said, If you will diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord your God, and will do that which is right in his sight, will give ear to his commandments, and keep all his statutes, which I will so put none of these diseases upon you, which I have brought upon the Egyptians, for I am the Lord that heals thee. And they came to Elam, where were twelve wells of water, and they encamped there by the twelve wells of water, and three score and ten palm trees, and they encamped there by the water. Uh, oh, the, the, the murmurings of Israel. You know, it seems like it didn't take very long uh, for them to get beyond Egypt's borders, uh, to get past the uh, you know, the uh, obvious, clear sign for the power of God, the goodness of God, and for them to start complaining about how uh, unjust, about how horrible, how hard uh, that things were. You know, these people have literally just seen God to break the power of the Egyptian army. They saw God do things that uh, were uh, Amazing in the simplest of terms. He, he parted the Red Sea. You know, he's, uh, he, they saw him, you know, with the water and the blood and the locusts and all those things. And all these things. And now here they are, uh, not even very much removed from all of that. And yet, where are they doing? They're complaining. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, what are we going to drink? You know, nothing here but, but bitter water. You know, what, what, what are we going to do? Yeah, we, we just saw you do all these amazing things. And we know how powerful, how amazing you are. But you know what? Well, what are we going to drink? Because there's no way we can survive off of this bitter water that's here. Of course, the, the amazing thing about this passage of Scripture really is, to me, that, uh, you know, first of all, God gave them sweet water uh, when he so, showed Moses the tree and cast the water to make it sweet. And then at the very end of this passage, uh, they don't just have one well. They actually find themselves in Elam in verse 27. That is 12 wells of water. Not only do they have water, but they've also got shade. Because it's got uh, uh, three, four, and ten palm trees. And so they've got shade. They've got water. Uh, God had always did take care of them. God could provide for them and take care of people in uh, any way he so chooses to. Whether that's uh, providing a, a tree to cast the water make it sweet. Or leading a little bit further on in the wilderness to come to well, a, a giant patch of whales. God takes care of people. Uh, but yet, in verse 26... We come to uh, the title there, the latter part of verse 26. God said, uh, I am the Lord that heals thee. That is uh, Jehovah uh, Rapha. That's the name for that there. The Lord that heals thee. That's what God said. God said, I am the Lord uh, that healeth thee. Uh, God is the source uh, of our healing. You know, what a, a blessedness that is to consider uh, and uh, to know as well. Uh, he is the Lord. Not only is he the Lord, he's also the Lord that heals and that makes the well. You know, when you think about the healing power of God, <clears throat> a 
Uh, obviously, there are many different areas in which we can see and look to know the healing power of God. <clears throat> but first of all, uh, the first major area, of course, that will kind of cover this in a few weeks, but uh, the first area where God heals, of course, is spiritually speaking. Uh, that wonderful passage we quote a lot out of Isaiah 53. It says, by his stripes, uh, we are healed. You know, you, we today know that we are uh, sinners by birth, sinners by choice, ways of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. Uh, we know that. But how is it that our sins can be cured? How is it that our sins can be forgiven? How is it that we who are spiritually dead can be healed and given life again? Well, that comes from the Lord that heals you. Uh, only the Lord has the power to heal uh, sin's death. The uh, power to overcome sin is solely in the power of the Lord. He is the Lord that heals us. And of course, the terms of sin, that healing ointment, uh, healing medication that covered sin, of course, was the blood of Christ. It was by his wounds that we are, by his stripes, by his wounds, by the blood that he shed, that our sins were forgiven. Yes, God is the one that heals us, that makes us well, uh, most importantly, from our spiritual element of sin, uh, that results in our spiritual death, and gives us to hell. But yet, through the sacrifice of Christ, we can have life. He is the God that heals us. The word of word of prayer this morning. Uh, Heavenly Father, Lord, we bow before you. And Father, thank you so much for just allowing us the ability to assemble here and to be here this morning. Lord, we ask your blessings upon this church and our ability to be a witness. I like for you here in our community. Help us to have wisdom and knowledge of what we need to be doing, the grace and strength we need to accomplish it. Lord, do just bless this nation. Father, God, leaders, help them to know how to the nation in godly fashion, this nation might turn to and seek you. Lord, do just bless each one of the prayer requests that lay upon our hearts. Bless the remainder of our churches here today. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, take your picture. Uh, as you know, we're looking at reasons we should <coughs> study doctrine now. We spend two or three weeks on. Why we shouldn't, as far as the world is concerned, why they don't want us to, and other religions don't want us to. Now we're looking at why we should. We're down to the third reason, I guess you'd call it. It says, doctrine will acquaint us with the details of God's eternal plan. And there are another four, five, six, somewhere around in here that we will look at. And the first one, Brother Ben got started into about Israel. It's God's eternal plan concerning the history of Israel. We find that in 1 Corinthians 10, going through 13. Well, why in the world should we worry about Israel's history? Well, Israel's history is our examples of what we as God's children are not to do. Not what we are to do, but what we're not to do. They are a good example of that. And God wants us to know. And you see that in that first verse. All these we're going to look at pretty well begins the same way. It says, Moreover, brethren, I would not I would not that you should be ignorant, now that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea, and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. Israel is our example. God didn't want us to be stupid. He wanted us to know how we as God's people were to act. First of all, you've got to be saved. Israel, picture of them, they were saved out of Egyptian bondage. They didn't save themselves. God did. God brought them out. We as God's people, when we're saved, we're saved from sin. We're saved from sin's bondage. We're brought out of bondage from sin. We're to live like we're not under the bondage of sin. Israel was baptized. Israel went through the Red Sea. You had the Red Sea on both sides, and you had the cloud overhead. The clouds water. They were completely submerged in water when they went through the Red Sea. We as God's people, once we're saved, we're to be baptized. We're to be submerged. You don't sprinkle water on them. You don't throw water on them. You stick them under the water. 
just like Israel was. They were completely under the water as they passed through the Red Sea. And did all eat the same spiritual meat? And did all drink the same spiritual drink? For they drank of the spiritual rock that followed them, and the rock was Christ. God not only fed them physically, he fed them spiritually. He gave them spiritual water, and he gave them spiritual food. That's Jesus. You find that out in the New Testament. He's called the bread of life. He's called the water of life. They were taught about his coming and dying on Calvary's tree. That's what all those sacrifices were for, was the teaching that Jesus would come and pay their sin debt. We look back. He paid our sin debt. We've been saved. We've been baptized. We're in a church. We're working and uh, supposed to serve him. But verse 5 says, but with many of them, God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. What happened? They didn't want to live the way God wanted them to. And Brother Ben brought up, they went all the way across that wilderness, crying, whining, complaining, wanting to go back. God just brought us out here to die. Well, as I said before, they got the wish because they all died out there. Those from 20 years and up except for Joshua and Caleb. They were overthrown in the wilderness. Why? Because they wouldn't listen to God. And then he gets into some of the, gets into some of the specifics. Now these things were our example to the intent we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. What got them in trouble? Lust. Their evil lust. They weren't satisfied with what God wanted. They wanted what they wanted. And it got them into trouble. We as God's people are not to lust after evil things. When you do, it gets you into trouble. Verse 7 says, Neither be ye idolaters, as were some of them, and it is written, The people sat down to eat, to drink, and rose up to play. Of course, this had to do with when Israel got to Sinai, if I remember right, it took three, maybe three months, maybe a little more for them to get to Sinai after they left Egypt. And it was being brought out. They just, all these miracles they just seen. You know, it had been a couple of months down the road. Here they're at Sinai. Moses goes up in the mountain to get the law. He's gone 40 days. And what's the first thing they do? Aaron builds a mile. What does Aaron do? Aaron's fixing to be the priest. The head priest. He builds them an idol. They worship this idol. This is the God that brought us out of Egypt. And that wasn't bad enough. They got to eat and got to drink and it turned into a big orgy. When Moses come down from the mountain, he said people running around naked. And this is God's chosen people. This is the one that brought them out of Egypt. This is things we're not supposed to do. We're supposed to worship God and God only, not anything else. Moses comes down, or God tells Moses to get down. I'm going to kill all these people. I'm through with them. Three months, four months, he's had them out of bondage, and he's through, he's ready to destroy them all. Moses, I'll make a nation out of you. Moses intercedes. He goes down from the mountain sees what they're doing, breaks the Ten Commandments. All of you on God's side, get over here. And I think it mainly, just mainly most of just the Levites that all went over there. And if you, I'm sure there were a few of the others. But it was the biggest part of them. Moses said, grab your swords, go in there and start killing. They killed 3,000 men. Women, it didn't say. It said they killed 3,000 men. And I'm sure men, well, the other, it takes more than one to what to do what they were doing. So I'm sure some women probably died too. And then after that he sends a plague on them. And it doesn't say how many died from the plague that he sent. We are to worship God and God only. He can do the same thing to us just like he did to them. There's our example to read and study. We've got plenty of examples. You've got the whole Old Testament to read about Israel and what they did and what they didn't do. 
you got verse 8 it says neither let us commit fornication to some of them committed and failed in one day two and twenty thousand of course this has to do when they went around Moab and you remember what happened to Moab Balaam tried to get Balaam to curse Israel God wouldn't let Balaam do it so Balaam does the next best thing Balaam get your prettiest women to run around in front of the Israeli men see what happens God will take care of them. So that's what Balak does. And of course, there's where you had your fornication, your adultery, and all that. 23,000 one day died because of what they done. What stemmed the tide was Phineas. He was a priest. He seen an Israeli man bring one of those women into camp took her into his tent. He said, Phineas grabbed a spear and went in there and ran it through both of them. Killed them. God stopped the plague. God stopped the, the killing man. You know, it never never really dawned on me until uh, either this week or last week, some preacher I was listening to was talking about this. He says, you know, we think of 23,000 dying. He said, that's awful, ain't it? He said, now you got to bury 23,000 people. Those that were living still had to bury them. <laughs> you know, out there, it, 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 that's a warm air country. Hot. It don't take long for bodies to blow, bust, and stink. So not only did God kill 23,000 people, these people had to bury them, get them out of the way. All the morning, crying over fathers, sons, mothers, daughters. Yeah, but that, that, that say there, you know, whether it just said men there also. I think it said men or just 23,000 people. They may, may not have stipulated it. No, it just didn't stipulate. So they all had to be buried. And of course that went on in, uh, when they were at Sinai too. You know, you still got to bury these people. If that don't remind you of something, you know, when you're sitting there burying all these people after God didn't kill them, you think they'd learn. Well, you think we'd learn too also, but we don't. In verse 9, it says, Neither let us tempt Christ, as some of them also tempted and were destroyed of serpents. And we know about that. As I said, they whined and cried about Moses all the time. They whined and cried about God. He took us out here. Uh, you won't feed us. And we're going to starve to death won't get us any water, we're going to die of thirst all the time tempting God you know, what you bring us out here for to kill us well, again God got tired of them, sent the serpents the serpents bit them, they started dying I don't remember if it states how many died from this or not but they began to repent and God told Moses, you know you get the brazen serpent, put it on a staff, set it out there in the middle of the camp those that will come to it and look to it and believe, won't die from the snake bites and they did <laughs> and then on down the line they start worshiping it instead of God you know he never they never learned and verse 10 says neither murmur ye as some of them also murmured and were destroyed of the destroyer now this happened several times where they murmured against God they murmured against Moses you know they going to stone Moses one time and uh, they were going to overthrow Moses one time oh, uh, Cora, I believe is his name and his bunch well Moses we're going to dethrone you we're taking over and God said no ye the ground opened up swallowed them their families their tents and then the ground closed up don't murmur against God don't complain when things ain't going your way. You couldn't be like one of them. They got to promised land. Finally there. They get the report from 12 spies. Of course, Dan said, nope, we can't do it. And two said, yeah, we can. Then they began to murmur, crying, whine, crying, complain again against God, against Moses. Oh, you brought us out here to die in the wilderness. God said, okay, that's what I'm going to get. You won't go into the promised land. 
to go back out in the wilderness and wander around for 40 years. Oh, no, 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 oh, no, we're going now, Lord. Uh, we don't want to die out there. We're going on into the promised land. Too late. Moses told him, God's not going with you. You're going to die out here or die trying to go in. So they, well, we're going anyway. Now, they wouldn't go when they had God behind them. Now they haven't got God behind them, but we're going to go now. We're going to defeat them. Real smart people, aren't they? Don't laugh too much at them. Look at some of the stupid things we do. I was going to say, it sounds familiar. <laughs> <laughs> and, of course, the ten spies were killed. The uh, army that went up against whoever they went to fight defeated them drove them out into the wilderness and there they were until 40 years were complete before all those died out and a new generation took over and were allowed to go in. Verse 11 says, Now all these things happened unto them for examples and they are written for, for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. There are examples until this world comes to an end of what we as God people are not to be. We're not to be murmurers. We're not to be complainers not to tempt the Lord, not to be fornicators, liars. All the Ten Commandments said that we're not to be. Verse 12 says, Wherefore let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. Did Israel think they had it made as long as they had the temple? How many times did they say, We've got God's temple. God's not going to do anything to us. We can worship false idols. We can do this. We can do that. We can even bring false idols into the temple. God's not going to destroy us. We've got his temple. We've got it made. It didn't work, did it? Babylonians destroyed the temple. Romans destroyed the temple. Don't think just because you're a child of God, you got it made. God take you out just as good as he put you in. Just as easy. Verse 13, that there have no temptation taken you but such as common to man, but God is faithful who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that ye may be able to bear it. When you think you've got a mumble right to the plan because something's come your way that you don't think you deserve, don't go mumbling and complaining. Pray to God that he'll have you go through it or take it away and leave it in his hands then. And you don't do stupid stuff. Or we don't do stupid stuff. I'm in the middle of it all also. Because we don't do stupid stuff that gets us in trouble with the Lord as Israel did. They are our example. We are to read and study about them and to see how we are to act, what we're to do, and what we're not to do. And the second one is God's eternal plan concerning the restoration of Israel. Israel will be restored, as we all know. Romans 11. through 27. For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant. Again, there's that statement. I want you to know. I don't want you to be stupid. I don't want you to be ignorant about all this stuff. I want you to know it. Read it and listen. For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, that you should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part is happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles become in. And so all Israel shall be saved, as it is written, there shall come out of Zion the deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant unto them, when I shall take away their sins. <clears throat> Israel will eventually be restored. They will look to Christ as their redeemer, their deliverer, which they rejected at his first coming. 2 Corinthians 3, 14 through 16 deals with the blindness of Israel. It says, But their minds were blinded, for until this day remaineth the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. 
but even unto this day when Moses has read, the veil is upon their heart. Nevertheless, when it shall turn, or when you shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. Israel as a nation is in blindness right now. They do not understand the word of God. That's what it amounts to. They did it to themselves. It may say God may have blinded them. But you remember Pharaoh? Remember how Pharaoh acted? You know, for the first three or four plagues, Pharaoh hardened his heart. Pharaoh hardened his heart. Pharaoh hardened his heart. Pharaoh hardened his heart. God hardened his heart. Israel rejected God's word. Israel rejected God's word. Israel rejected God's word. Israel killed his son. God blinded him. They wanted it. They got it. They're blind now. It's hard for them to understand Christ. But if one does, as it says there in that 16th verse, if one will believe, the veil's taken away. And you can see that if you ever talk to any Jews that have been saved. They understand all the Old Testament then. After that, it's easy for them to understand. But they are in blindness now, and they will be in blindness until uh, the church age, the Gentile age, has come to an end. Hebrews 10. But they brought this blindness on themselves, just like Pharaoh brought the hardening of his heart on himself. They continued to refuse God. Verses uh, Hebrews 10, 16 through 17. That this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. This is after the tribulation and all that stuff's over with. I will put my laws into their hearts and in their minds when I write them. And their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. So God will wipe away their sins. As a nation, they will be saved. And of course, that will all take place during the millennial reign of Christ. All that God has promised Israel that has to come true will come true then. They will be uh, saved as a nation and as people. Now, of course, as people, they'll have to come to Christ just like everybody else did. They're not automatically going to be saved. They still have to come to Christ. But their minds will be open. Their eyes will be open where they can see and understand that Christ was their Messiah. Still is their Messiah. I don't remember somewhere I read. I don't remember if it was in a book or it was in the Bible somewhere I read how they're going to weep and wail and cry and moan when they see Jesus coming in the air. When they see the scarred hands. When they see the scarred feet. You're the one we killed. You were the Messiah. You're the one we rejected. How they're going to feel when they do see and understand who Christ really is, really was. Uh, let's drop down to the last one. I mean, the third one's going to take a while. Uh, e is uh, God's eternal plan concerning the destruction of the earth found in 2 Peter 3. Second Peter 3, 8 through 10. Again, we have that statement, but beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years and a thousand years is one day. Nor is not slack to turn against promises as some men count slackness, but is long suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. This world as we know it one day will be brought to an end. God wanted us to know about it. He didn't want us to 
to be misled and not understand. You know, there are many people today that say this world is not going to come to an end. It's going to go on, go on, go on. Then there are those that say, you know, eventually it is, has to come to an end. But that's millions of years on, on down the road. Well, that's that's in God's hand. You know, it states there, you get a lot of people that try to say, well, the God of days a thousand years, a thousand years a day. Now, that's not what it says. You know, a lot of your evolutionists say, you know, maybe God did have something to do with it, and your one day in the in the creation is, is, is a thousand years instead of 24 hours, like it's supposed to be. Uh, well, no. Oh, go ahead. I said baloney. <laughs> no. All that thousand years, one day, one day, all that means is God don't go on timetable. Clocks, dates, months, years, weeks, doesn't have anything to do with when he does something or how he does something. He does it when it's right. When the time was right, Christ came. When the time was right, God created heaven and earth. When the time was right, he created everything else. When the time is right, Christ will come back for his people. When the time is right, he'll come back to this earth. When the time is right, God will destroy this earth. It has nothing to do with calendars, years, dates, or anything else. God doesn't work that way. Time is just for God's people. For us here on this earth. You know, we won't worry about time once we get to heaven. We won't care about time. Time won't be nothing to us up, up in heaven. Just like it is with God. history teacher in college that was supposed to be a Baptist. He said he was a Baptist. He may have even been a Baptist deacon, I think. Anyway, he believed that whole, you know, evolution and creation mixed thing. Yeah, yeah. You know, God got it started. And, then, and he would say, I don't know why y'all argue so much as Christians with evolutionists. Y'all could both be right. And I was like, no, we really can't. <laughs> so, Apparently he didn't read Genesis. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's not the same thing. But after the millennium, either just before the great white throne judgment or during the great white throne judgment, the earth as we know it, the heavens as we know it, will be no more. They will be completely wiped away. You know, I'll, I'll listen to a professor, I guess what you'd call it. You know, uh, and uh, through whatever they, 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 they do, they know that this universe is going to end. It has to come to an end. It, the only way I can explain this, everything just keeps getting faster and faster and faster and faster and faster in our universe. It's going to can't keep up. And it, I guess if you want to say a big bang and blows up, well, I don't know how God's going to do it. If there could be a big bang and everything melts down, I don't know. Or whether everything just automatically just starts melting. I don't know how he's going to do it. Because it's going to be with fervent heat when he does it. It's going to melt. And he will do it. You know, those same people, as I said, they think it's millions all down the years uh, before this will happen. But... Uh, At the least, it's a thousand seven years away. But God said, "Come, Christ, come back now." There's at least a thousand seven years left in this world when God decides to come back. When God decides to put an end to all this, He will do it in His own time, in His own way. And God wants us to understand that. Y'all got anything y'all want to add to it? Any of any of it? 